you know, I always tell a story that uh, I was part of the interview team that interviewed Will Mayo to come back to work at TCC a few years back. And it was just an honor for me to even be part of that. And it didn't feel like an interview at all. He started talking about the history of TCC and the health compact and a lot of things that, you know, were before my time. And, you know, I just sat there. I think we talked for probably over two hours and, and it was just so interesting to hear that. And so with that, that is why I really wanted him to be our keynote speaker. Um, you know, we, we're told so many times how we need to better document our history, and we have so many young Native leaders coming up in the ranks now that I thought it was really important to have Will be here and kind of help bring us up to speed on where we've come from. So thank you, Will. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chief. I'll try this. Uh, can you hear me okay? Everybody all right? So it's really, uh, I, I'm, I was surprised at how nervous I was. I know people said, oh, shut up, you're not nervous. <clears throat> but I understand who I'm speaking to. And I understand the importance of the theme of this convention. And it's been weighing heavily on my heart that I could leave a message with you that would resonate with your heart. And I did not want to misspeak. I remember so many times the elders, they would tell us, be careful what you say. Whenever you talk in the potlatch, be careful about your words because you can, if you can go off the, the trail if you don't carefully think about it. And <clears throat> I, I remember that interview that, that Brian talked about and we, we spent two hours there. I was just happy to have this group of people I could talk to. I had been out of, uh, kind of out of circulation for a while, and it was just so much fun to, to talk to them. I wanted to acknowledge our first traditional chief, Trimble Gilbert, I want to acknowledge our second traditional chief, Andy Jimmy, uh, Danakanaga elders who helped guide us and keep the light on the path for us. I wanted to acknowledge all of the tribal delegates. You're in a direct line from some really powerful leaders who could foresee what was going to be needed to bring us to this day. I also wanted to acknowledge Chief Ridley, the Tanana Chief's Executive Board, for your service. I also want to acknowledge and recognize the emerging leaders and the youth delegates and congratulations to McKinsey. Thank you for your comments. Very impressive young leader there. Just had a, a few couple minutes to visit and uh, I, think, I think we're going to be in good hands if they're growing them up like that. So thank you Gwichaje for doing a good job with your young people. <clears throat> I also wanted to acknowledge the staff of Tanana Chiefs. They expend their energies, their heart, to carry out the work and serve, or serve the people. So 
So I just want to thank the staff as well and acknowledge them today as I, I speak. Uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> I wanted to introduce myself by the Dana name that I was given by my uncle Arthur Matthew. My uncle Arthur Matthew, he passed in the mid-90s. And before he passed, he, he was telling me stories. Because I, I, uh, I would fly out to Tanana. He was, um, he was receiving his end-of-life care in Tanana. And so I would fly out to be with him uh, weekly uh, and spend two or three days. And he told me a lot of funny stories, and he told me a lot of good stories. Uh, and he told me stories about our family, our ancestors from long ago. And he told me about a couple that uh, was in our family line <clears throat> in Tanana by the name of Saint Lito. As, uh, his name was Saint Lito, and his wife was Bitsi Tehudana. And they lived a long time ago. And, it, and he said, I want to give you that name. And he gave me that name, Saint Lifto. And I was very moved by what he did. And it's, it's a word picture. And it's, it's not easy to, to interpret, uh, but translate, but it's roughly uh, about an eagle that flies in the mountains in the summer. And the, 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 the word taught on the end denotes a leader or even a father. And so this name was very, is a very... Uh, powerful, very powerful name. And uh, I, I thought, how could I carry this name? But, uh, but he gave it to me and I accepted it, Saint Lito. And, uh, <clears throat> and his wife's name was Pitsi Dehutano. And he said, that's what I want your wife to have that name. And so I... Just wanted to introduce myself by that name. Uh, for, a, for a time as a baby, I was living with my aunt and uncle in Old Minto. I was uh, just a baby. My mother was uh, giving me to them for adoption. And uh, they... They raised me when I was just uh, an infant. And my uncle, he gave me the name uh, Batuch. And he called me that all the time I was growing up. And he'd always have a big smile on his face. And he'd say, Batuch. And somebody later on changed it to Butch. I like Batuch better. <laughs> and uh, he, his name was Tim Charlie from Minto. And he married my auntie, Isabel. She was my auntie from my grandfather's side, Chief Matthew. And so my mom's sister. So my mom was giving me to them to raise and to, to adopt. And after a time, my mother changed her mind. <laughs> and uh, so she brought me back to Fairbanks and raised me there. Um, but I always remember my times with Uncle Tim and Auntie Isabel. Uh, Uncle Tim passed when I was 17. And Auntie Isabel passed not, not that long ago. But to me, they represent the beauty of our people. 
You know, as I was growing up, my mother, she would never hold me. She wouldn't hold the, us kids. So all the time I was growing up, I never was held. During those years, I did not have a father in the home. And so there was no father that I could feel that what I needed as a, as a boy. But my mom told me years later why. She, uh, she, had, she had contracted tuberculosis in her late 20s. And they sent her down to Valdez, or not Valdez, where is that sanatorium down in southeast Alaska. And lots of our people wound up there. And they wound up removing over half of her lung capacity uh, and, and a surgery. And she was down there for over two years. But she said when she was finished with her treatment, her doctors told her, they said, Agnes, you cannot hold your children. You have, you'll have that TB inside of you for the rest of your life. And you can pass it on to your children just by holding them and breathing on them. And that's why she didn't hold us. And I cannot tell you the, the damage that that does to a child. If you can imagine never feeling the warmth of being held against your mother's bosom, to hear, feel her breath on your face, making mother sounds. I never had that ever, ever, ever. And it's damaging to a child. We have to have that human touch. You might be asking, why are you talking about this? I'm talking about it because of our theme. One people, one voice. How can we be united at the heart level with love if we aren't treating one another like mothers and fathers? If we aren't having fun and hugging and looking in each other's eyes with love, Without that, where, where will the unity come from? All of the good things in life, every good thing in life springs from healthy, loving relationships. It all comes from that. And when my mother told me I was probably in my early, maybe 12 or something, and I was trying to snuggle up to her. I always tried to snuggle up to her, and she pushed me away. she said, say, Butchie, don't. And I didn't understand why. And then she told me, I can't, son. I don't want you to get sick. And that was another one of the challenges that we had out of many challenges uh, was fighting just to stay alive and having to deny love and human contact with others. Other reasons, there's many reasons for that. I want to stop that part of the story and I just want that, I just hope that sinks in because it's not only true of that, that young infant, that, that five-year-old, that seven, eight, 10, 13, 
I'm going to tell you a secret. It's true for the 71-year-old that's standing before you right now. I treasure these times when we come together. I treasure them. I treasure seeing you again. I treasure the hugs, the smiles, the joking. What I, what I feel is love. I treasure it so much and these meetings are so important. And I want that to sink in. We can't communicate with one another only on the level of our, of our intellect. We must bring it to our heart in everything we say. And we must move it from our heart to our people, to those next to you. And we must forgive. We have to forgive. I remember a story. I remember uh, when I was president of TCC, I had a very, very difficult time with, uh, with uh, some, some issue. And there were other leaders that were, that were uh, we were in deep disagreement. And it, it didn't feel good. And I remember one night I went home and I was thinking about it. I couldn't turn it off. And I could see one angry face of a leader that was just this big and nothing else would fit in my mind that night. And I was struggling with it so hard. And I remember going to bed and I went to sleep, but I didn't go to sleep for hours. And the only reason I went to sleep is because my wife woke up. She, she knew I was awake, that I was tossing. And she woke up and she turned and she said, what's wrong? I said, I can't get this. I can't get this angry face of this leader out of my mind and I can't go to sleep. I hear those words. I hear the angry words. And she, <laughs> she said, pray for him. And she turned around and went back to sleep. I sat there, I laid there and I began to pray for him. I prayed for him for good success in his leadership. I prayed for his children, that they would grow up to be successful, strong, healthy. I prayed for his community. And before I knew it, I was waking up. It was morning and I had felt so refreshed. And I also, while I was praying for him, I said, Lord, I forgive him. And I hope for my words, he can forgive me. I forgive him. He owes me nothing. He has nothing, no debt to me. And when I finished that, I went to sleep and I slept so soundly that night. That was probably about three in the morning I went to sleep. And it worked so good. It worked so good that I decided that next day, because my heart changed towards him. Everything changed in my, in my mind towards him. I was a different person. And I, I said, I'm going to do this for everybody I can think of who ever hurt me. I just want to ask you a question. Some of you are my age or older. 
many of you who are younger. Do faces come up in your memories from a long time ago of what somebody hurt you, of what was said to you, of how you were treated? Does that happen to anybody here? Well, I began to pray, and I went all the way back in my memories, all the way back, and I prayed for everyone. Some of them had passed away. I prayed for them. I forgave them, and I told them, you do not owe me anything. You have no debt to me. I release you. I forgive you, and with all my heart, I'm going to love you. And I did that for everything, everything from the beginning, all the way up to that day. And it began, it began to change and soften. And this is what is required in order to achieve one people and one voice. We have to cross that gap with each other and with our past. We must do it. We've got to clean that house. So I'm going to, uh, I want to move on. I had intended to um, honor somebody very, very important to me. I want to honor them, and uh, I wanted to honor my wife, Dr. Yvonne Mayo. She's, uh, she's with me here today. She's probably, oh, there she is. <laughs> hey, babe. My uncle, my uncle gave her that name, but see, I, I can't remember exactly what it means. It's something like what she hears, she, uh, she learns, and she follows it. It's something like that. And the... Uh, <clears throat> She, uh, she was given her name by, by my uncle. She uh, earned her master's degree in divinity from the Christian Life School of Theology out of Columbus, Georgia in 2005. And then she earned her doctorate at the same institution in 2007. And... Uh, she, I, I just call her sweetie, um, but she has uh, been my anchor and she continues, she often leads me with wisdom and we give and take from each other, from our lessons. I'm just going to say this. When I first saw her, we were in Bible college down in Seattle. She was 18. Woo <laughs> Pretty hot, too. And uh, I was 21. And I was uh, a junior. In, the, in my junior year, we were both working towards our, our bachelor's degrees. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I got the nerve to, uh, to ask her for a date. And uh, there's people all around, kind of like a group like this. We just broke up from a gathering and people were visiting and I walked over to her and said, excuse me, excuse me. 
would, would you like to come with me? And I, I gave her an offer I thought she could never refuse. I said, would you come with me? We're, we're going to the Seattle Rescue Mission downtown. <laughs> we're going to serve. And then after that, we're going to go street witnessing. We're going to go evangelize in the street. It's nighttime in Seattle. She turned me down cold. <laughs> but she said this. She's turning me down because of a family gathering for something called Thanksgiving. And uh, so with that, I didn't feel so rejected. It's hard to argue with family. So I let her off the hook. But I came back again, and she said yes. And we started our, uh, our dating and our romance. We got married about a year later. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, we did go. We actually did finally manage to get downtown. But we also went to elders' homes and we went to uh, institutions for the, uh, for the uh, disabled. And there we made friends with the people in those places. And I got to see her heart. And So we married in 1975. I married my teenager 48 years ago. And, uh, and it's getting sweeter and sweeter. It just gets better. Doesn't it, sweetie? Yeah. If she's looking a little stressed or feeling a little pain, I go over and kiss her up. I tell her how pretty she is. I better quit. <laughs> don't, want, don't want this to get, you know, out of hand here. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Um, I want to go on. After I graduated from that school, we came straight to Tanana. And we stayed with my sister, Kathy, Kathy Roberts. She, uh, she had a little bitty cabin. I don't think it was 15 by 20, where her and my late nephew were living. And she took care of us. We didn't have a thing. We didn't have a thing. I remember putting all of our belongings in a 24-foot Washita riverboat. Had a 45-horse Johnson on the back. I remember I was uh, heading down to Tanana from Fairbanks with all of our worldly belongings. <laughs> and <clears throat> between Old Minto and Tolavana, the motor just went... <sighs> Pretty soon we're drifting. I took the hood off and it's still idling. Just in time, I saw the high speed jet needle rattling and it fell down into the engine. And there's at the bottom of the engine, there's a hole about that big. And you can see the river through it. Guess where that jet needle went? just as pretty as you can be, a swisher, right down that hole. And without it, you know, you can't, it, it won't go. It just, it'll idle, but it needs that high-speed needle to go. So me and my buddy, we, we had a little box of tools. Oh, what, what can we do? We can't drift a tan an hour too far. And so we dug around in there and we found a 16-penny nail in the bottom. 
And we had a file and we filed it, filed it nice on the end, nice and smooth and round to a point. And then we, we chewed gum. And we put gum in that hole and we put that nail in there. And we move that nail, give it some gas. And I can't just hold it here like that. So we put sticks around it and we put more gum around it. And that thing, silly thing worked, got us all the way to Tanana. That's a Indianuity, they said. Anyway, <clears throat> we went to Tanana. My wife started a, a little group for children, a children's club. And man, I'd come home from, from work, and that house is full of kids. It's just a 15 by 20 cabin, you know, and full of kids, can't walk through it. They're all having fun. And uh, she, she ran that, that youth group. Those kids, you know, they were only, what, 10, 12, maybe 14 years younger than us. Uh, so today, we still have many close friendships from those children from Tanana who remember my wife's kids club. What am I talking about? I'm talking about love. I'm talking about healthy interactions. Without it, there's no one people. There's no one voice. And if there is, it's not as strong. It's not as strong. Having that kind of a voice. Oh, I remember this too. I, uh, we started a men's group in Tanana. And we would meet every week and we made plans and we decided we're going to, each of us is going to find a boy and we're going to take them out with us out, in, out on trips. We're going to just have fun with them. And we were looking for boys who didn't for various reasons, whatever reasons, they didn't have a man around to show them things and to love on them. So we, we picked them and we just took off. We'd go, out, we'd go out to 14 Mile, heading out towards the Tozy River. We'd hit those Ray Mountains and we'd hunt ptarmigan. We would build a big fire and cook. We had so much fun with those boys. Those are lifetime relationships now. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. We had uh, sustained sweet memories. What I, want, what I think is the truth is that the thing that this theme is about is healthy, loving relationships. When everything else is stripped away, that is what binds us together. It sustains us with sweet, warm memories. Because my mom couldn't hold me, I was like a dry sponge with no moisture. It was so hard. But whenever I had somebody who would hold me, like Auntie Isabel, or I would have somebody like um, my sister Kathy. She's nine years older than me. She became my, mo my mom, poor thing. I remember I used to, one time she was trying to have fun with her girlfriends. She was like 16. I'm in, I'm uh, crying behind her, walking, following her, crying after her, calling her mama, mama. And she's so embarrassed in her girlfriends. <laughs> yeah. she, didn't, she didn't know what to do. And then one time she was in school, and I walked over to the school, and they had ground-level windows. And I just walked out of the house in my diaper. And I walked over to the school, and I stood in front of those windows looking for her. 
And when I found her, I was... <laughs> my poor sister. I also have another one. I think of her as my grandmother. Her name was Bessie, or correction, Eva Barnabas Moffat. She was from Salchacket. She's a Salchacket people. And my mom would take me over there when I was a baby, and she'd tell me, later on, Eva said, Ah, I had to watch you close. <laughs> One time, I guess there was a big carpenter ant, and I was sitting on the floor in my diaper, and I, I saw that ant, I grabbed it, and she looked over just in time. <laughs> she ran over, and she's digging around, and it's all gone. <laughs> so she, but she would hold me. She would hold me and that dry sponge would get filled. And I remember laying as an older boy, I remember laying against her. And she was, she was a little portly. She was so soft and warm. And she made these, these cooing sounds when she would hold me. And those sounds, that feel, and she smelled wonderful. Those memories, I'm standing here and I can, I can hear it. I can smell it. Her beautiful fragrance. And <clears throat> I, I think about those things. Those are the things that are important to me. And when I walk in this room, I see different ones of you. And I feel that. And you give me hugs and you look at me with a big smile and I feel I soak in your love. If you're not hugging up everybody in here, you're missing out. You got it. You just, I just, uh, it's a, such a wonderful thing. When I come here, I feel that way. I'm, I got to move on. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Chief, when, are you, when do you have to kick me off? I'm a good, okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, am, am I talking to you? Am I, am I reaching you? I mean, are you feeling this? Yeah. It, it's what I come here for. I love you guys. <clears throat> I think about what we have come through so much already. And I think, you know, we've got this. We've got this. Why? Because we have each other. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. We move on. We move on. Sometimes somebody's going through a rough time. I was going through a rough time just a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago. And I was working here at TCC under Chief uh, Victor Joseph, and there was a rough spot I went through there. I'd come to work, and I really felt low. I was having a real struggle. But there was always people at work who when they saw me, their face would light up and they would lift up my heart just seeing them. I could name, I could name a few of them right now. And you're treasures to me. I see some of my old co-workers in here. I see my old mentor and chief, Spud Williams, I survived Spud Williams. <laughs> you know, Spud, he can be kind of rough, you know, a little rough around the edges. But I worked closely with him, and I saw another side of him that people don't see too much. I saw a tender man who cared deeply. He cared deeply. Behind his 
his uh, persona. In those moments when we were facing difficult decisions, when people were, lives were in the balance, services that were needed, I saw the tenderness. When our late traditional chief, Andrew Isaac, was sick, Spud Williams would go to his bed and massage his feet. You hear me, what I'm saying? And I learned a lot from him and as an employee, and then I was sandwiched between him and Mitch Dementev. <laughs> after, after Spud, uh, his terms were over, then Mitch got elected, and there I was working for a, the, the other member of the Ninana Mafia. <laughs> uh, uh, those were the guys who mentored me. And I remember working with Claude Dementev before that. Oh my goodness. It's a wonder I turned out so sweet. <laughs> they taught me so much, those guys. I was, I was privileged to walk in the presence of our great leaders. And then I walked, I walked with Kathy Pollack for the brief time that she was able to serve. There was no greater loving person. Do you, you know what I'm saying? That woman's heart was as big as the sky. She loved so deeply. And then I had my term in 1991. I was elected till 1999. Went through three elections. And, um, <clears throat> and then I left for a while and I put in for a job here. And Victor Joseph was the chief. And I went through that interview and I got hired and had the privilege to work under his leadership. Remember, I, I had been the president. I had been a staffer. I'd worked under many people. And the experience I had working for Victor was I, I just in awe of his leadership, the things he accomplished. I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's just been a wonderful time and privilege to work with such people. I think about our past leaders. They united for land claims. One people, one voice. They came together, uh, uniting for things like land claims. They, they passed down our songs and our dances. They prayed for us. Before we were even born, some of us. They prayed for us. I, I remember in Fort Yukon, I was attending a meeting there. I sat next to an elder. I didn't know him. He started talking to me. And he said, uh, so who, where are you from? I told him, oh, my dad's from Rampart. My, my mom's from Tanana. He said, oh, who, who's your, who are they? I told him, he said, oh, you're, you're Chief, Chief, Chief Matthew's grandson, huh? I said, yeah. He said, oh, I know Chief Matthew. He used, to, he used to come up river to Stevens Village and he would pitch his tent on the sandbar below the village. And us, we were just kids. And we would go and we would, we would hear this man shouting. He's in his tent and he's shouting, just hollering. And we, we snuck up on his tent and it was Chief Matthew. He was praying. He was on the sandbar in his tent praying so loudly that the kids in the village came down. He said, we threw sticks at his tent. <laughs> they were a little mischief. They were praying for us. 
The, um, they also told us about connections that we had. Connections I had no idea about. One time I was, I was uh, in Chalkitsik. David Salmon, the late David Salmon was our traditional chief. And he invited me to stay with him. He could cook a good breakfast, that guy. And he, he was calling me nephew. Nephew? I know that David Salmon wouldn't just throw that stuff around. And, and he finally, he looked at me, he said, you know why I call you nephew? I said, no. I'll tell you why I call you nephew. My sisters and I, his sister, um, his sisters and he found themselves, their parents had passed. They were young. And they said that a woman from uh, living in Stevens Village, she, she adopted us. She took us home and she raised us. David Salmon and his sisters. <clears throat> his sisters were uh, Annie James and Martha Flitt. And this, this woman, she's your grandmother. Her name was Alice. And I was raised up next to your Uncle Arthur. And I remember Chief Matthew, when he'd come to Stevens Village, he would stay with us. That's why I call you nephew. Your family took care of us. So you're my family too. These are the kinds of things. I'm going to go quickly through something here. The TCC leadership, back in the 70s, Mitch Domenoff was, what, 18 years old? And he got elected as chief uh, president. And him and Claude Domenoff's cousin, they were working together, and they started pulling together programs, services. TCC had nothing, practically. Now, I know this is where I can get in trouble because I don't have the history perfect. So I might get something a little wrong, but just hear my heart. And before there was 638, tribes couldn't just contract the BIA and IHS programs. They had to pull together different grants and fundings to try to put it together. And they made a decision back then in those early 70s, that is a fateful decision for TCC. They made a decision to create the Tanana Chiefs Health Authority. And they started services. They started uh, pulling together services that they would, uh, that they began with uh, for, for our region. And they pulled together Things like uh, they took on the, the health aid program. Their first budget for that was 200K. Well, we all know that the health aids worked for nothing for years. They worked out of, the, out of their love for us. And think of the things they witnessed and saw. The damage, the, the wounds, the accidents of young and old. And they did it for no, no charge out of love in their heart. But they pulled this program into TCC and they got a couple hundred thousand. They started uh, running that. They got the community health development program, the uh, community health representative program. They did mental health and alcohol services plus emergency medical services. I remember as a young person in Tanana, I, my first 
contact with TCC was I volunteered to serve on our uh, Yukon Tanana Mental Health Board. And I, I served on that board and had the privilege to advocate for mental health and alcohol services uh, in Juneau and, and to guide the, that program. So they, they started pulling this together back then. Well, in 1975, the 638 law was passed. President Nixon signed it into law. And this was groundbreaking. And about that time, Spud Williams was elected. He shepherded the, the Tanana chiefs into those, uh, into those contracts. And about, uh, until that time, Tanana chiefs' budget was about a million dollars. And then after 638, uh, by the time I joined the staff in 1984, moving from Tanana to Fairbanks, Spud hired me. We had about $8 million at that time when Spud was working in there, but it was growing. And it wasn't enough money. Uh, we had, uh, they had to organize it. They created the sub-regional offices. They put resources and jobs and responsibilities in those sub-regional offices around our area. They hired a sub-regional director. That's when I first met Steve Guinness. They hired an uh, assistant. And then different program people. And those offices would serve the villages in that sub-region. And this grew and began to develop. And the, um, by the time I became president, we had the 1991, we had the new law under 638. They passed Title III, IV, and V. And this was called the Self-Governance Project, uh, the Self-Governance. And so we were able to compact. That means we could take functions out of the government and run them here. We reduced the size of the BIA and the IHS, but first the BIA in early 90s, 92, 93. And we were able to collect a good bunch of money. And we decided that what we needed to do uh, was to make sure that every tribe had a tribal office, desk, chairs, furniture, a telephone. I remember when we used to, Spud would send us out to the village, we'd go out and meet with the chief in their house. We'd say, did you get our letter? Oh, I don't know, let me see. And they'd pull a box out from under the bed and here's a whole bunch of TCC letters. <laughs> the, most of it's not open. You start looking through there, oh goodness, there's a, a check. You know, and but they didn't have the help. They didn't have a way to create a tribal office. So the big task in 1991, two, three, was to get a tribal office started in every village and to hire us the first uh, tribal administrators. And I remember looking at the team and saying, we got to pull this off. I want it done in two years, by 1993. We got it done in a year and a half. Every tribe had a staff. And then we negotiated the first BIA compact. And that gave us some additional money. So we created the tribal shares. We added that to each tribe's account. And now the tribal councils had a budget to decide on how to spend it. They had staff to follow through on their on their directives and pursue other monies. They began to grow, they began to expand, and, uh, and it, it was uh, a wonderful thing, but we couldn't support the sub-regional offices anymore. All the money now was going directly to the tribes instead. So we closed the sub-regional offices about 1993, I think it was, because we needed we couldn't support both the tribal offices um, uh, the way we needed to, and the sub-regional office. 
That's just a little history. I'm kind of screaming through it after a whole bunch of stories, but the, the, the tribes began to really demonstrate self-determination, self-governance. And today, then we created a path whereby tribes could contract on their own. They could compact on their own. And that process is continuing today. Tribes have the determining power to say how they want to do that. Some of them uh, we help, some of them, uh, by we I mean the Tanana chief's structure, some of them took it on themselves, they're doing everything on their own. This was real power. This was real self-determination and practicing sovereignty. And so today, the tribes are healthy. Tribes are moving forward. Um, then in 19, around 19, around that time, the Indian Health Service, the law began to, they, they did a demonstration project and they said, we're going to allow 20 compacts for the whole nation. The whole nation, 20 compacts. Alaska, you can have one compact and that's all you get. Well, we got 12 health 12 or 13 health providers, uh, regionals, and we were all sitting around the table looking at each other like poker players. Who's going to get that compact? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? We're all looking at each other. Which one of us is going to out-politic the others, outmaneuver the others and win this one Alaska compact for ourselves. That's what it felt like. And I remember coming home from a meeting and sitting in the office, I called all the staff together. And I said, look, I, I want that compact. We need that. Why is that? Because whoever's first in the, with the compact will have a major determining power over what the funding uh, allocation methodology is going to be. You'd have an advantage and you could possibly get more money than you actually should. I'm, I'm sorry, that's just how it works sometimes. And, and, and I said, but I, I, I'm just wanting to have a discussion. What can we do? And we were talking about it how do we get this and that? And then we started thinking, you know, we could lose it. We, we may not be the ones who get that compact for health. So what are we going to do? Just, you know, what are we going to do? Well, there's got to be a better way. What if everybody could be in on it? That's the idea that came up. Could, could everybody be in on it? All of the regions... What if we could get one compact that we could all sign on to? We closed the meeting and I started calling all of the health directors down at Search, over at Canna, Nome, all up north, all around the whole state. I called those health directors and I said, I'd like to meet with you. Can we meet? We got the meeting put together. We met in Anchorage. I said, why can't we all join in one compact as co-signers? Could we do that? And they started, we started talking about it. And they, after three meetings and quite a bit of arguing, we finally all decided, yes, we will request that one Alaska compact to be for all of us together. We'll all be part of it. And we'll just negotiate our portion of it. This way, we could all be at the table to decide on our funding allocation formula, and nobody can pull a fast one. We'll all decide on what's fair. And we took every program that IHS was running. The other thing that we said was, if we can get this one compact, we are automatically set up to be able to take over 
the new ANMC that was being built in Anchorage. We could take it over. And with it, we could take over the statewide health, native health system. And it would be self-determined in our hands. And so with that, we began to pull that together. And we called a meeting with the IHS and we told them what we wanted to do. The idea worked its way all the way back to Washington. They talked about it in the, in the where all the hoi polloi meet, off there in the, the big shot land. And after a period of time, they said, yes, we think you can do that. And we began to put together the Alaska, uh, uh, all Alaska Health Compact. And it's been a wonderful success. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of years later, uh, under uh, ANHB's leadership, we started, and uh, Andy Jimmy serving on there, we started putting together the plan to create the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. And that consortium would take over the new hospital. Before long, that all came together. And so today we have one statewide native run health organization that we all are a part of, that we all have a voice in. We have power in DC. We've got power uh, to, um, to protect our interests on the national level. There's no other compact like it in the nation. And it's an amazing example of one people, one voice. And these are the things that we accomplish when we pull it together. I want to close. I want to uh, say that, um, uh, that we, we, we are a family, that we stand with one another when any one of us is hurting. And I, and I wanted to bring this in, if I could just change the, 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 the whole uh, subject. And I want to come from here now. I want to come from here. I don't want to just leave you talking about history out of my head. I want to bring us here because it's from here where the real healing takes place. It's from here where the real love can be demonstrated. It's from here that we can accomplish that theme of one people, one voice. And it'll never be broken. It'll never be broken. Chief Tecumseh, that was his, his saying. If we're all joined together, you cannot break it. And we, we have among us, including myself, who is still recovering. I'm still recovering from wounds of the past. Well, I've come a long way. I'm, I'm better than I used to be. But as a child, my home was not a safe place. My mom, in later years, she began to help women into sobriety. She would bring home Native women from all around the region. She'd take care of them and nurse them through their withdrawals, get them into AA, and get them into sobriety. I watched her do that, but that didn't happen until I was 13 years old. Until that time, my mother drank heavily. Until that time, she was under that control. So my, my home was not a safe place. As a child, I was victimized. As a child, I, I experienced abuse. My mom never laid a hand on me, but she, neither could she care for me the way she, she could have. But I found myself experiencing 
physical abuse, sexual abuse. I found myself with multiple abusers in my life. I remember with my, my baby girls, my son, as they were growing up, I'd hold them and love on them. I'd whisper to them, how precious. And I'd always take my girls, I'd look them in the eye. And I did this all the time and I'd say, sweetheart, you're smart and you're pretty, you're beautiful. You know why I did that? Because I knew that at some point in their life, somebody was going to tell them they're stupid. Huh? Somebody was going to tell them, you're ugly. You got funny ears. You got a funny nose. And I wanted them to know that that wasn't true. I wanted them to grow up know, just hearing my voice echoing in their heart, you're smart, and you're pretty, you're handsome. I wanted them to know. But today here in this room, we have people who are hurting. I know what that feels like. We have people who also have recently lost loved ones and you're hurting inside. And I want to do something as I close. I would like to surround you. If you're struggling, it's not a weakness, it's not a sign that you're, you're less. You're human. And you may be hurting right now because of losses in your life. Loved ones, precious, and you feel the loss so deeply. My sister-in-law, Hazel, she's lost family. It's heavy. It's hard. We have people who are struggling, and I want to surround you. Is it okay if I do this? I want to close with this. I want you to know the love, the feeling of the love. We get enough hard stuff, don't we? We get enough anger, wounded people who lash out. I miss my nephew. I miss my brother-in-law. Very, very much. And it hurts. If there's anybody like that in here right now, I'm going to ask you to step out. I'd like you to come up here. We'll just take a minute. Who will do it? Who will be the first? Because I know there are many. I just want you to come and stand up here. And what I want to happen, these folks are hurting in their heart. What I want to happen, some of you have hurts that are decades old, personal pain. You've been hurt and injured. I want to surround you. Maybe nobody has held you and told you how much they love you and how much they stand with you. But I want that to happen here today. I want all the rest of you, if I could ask you to come, anybody who wants to, you don't all have to come. But what I'm, what I'm after here is human contact. I want the rest of you to come and surround these. And if I could ask you, to come in close because I'm going to ask others to come around you. All of you that came up, I'm going to ask others to come around you and I'm going to ask them to put their, their arm around you if that's okay. And we're going to think about your loved ones that you are missing. 
We're going to think about the, the hard things and we're going to stand with each other. And we're going to love on one another. This is what is the description of one people, one voice. But I want to add this to it. We're also one heart. I want you to have contact. I don't want anybody to be standing alone. Just come on in. Just push right on through here, any of you that want to. Get in here and, and put your hands on your brother and your sister to comfort I want you to take that, that hurt uh, and that, that pain. And the first thing I want you to do is if you have ever blamed yourself for anything, I want you to forgive yourself. Some of us have struggled with that. If you can't love yourself, you'll never love others the way you need to. Do you hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? If you can't love yourself, I didn't love myself. I was stupid. I believed I was stupid. I was worthless. At 18 years old, I was suicidal, wandering Anchorage and Fairbanks, lost. And a friend came and he, he told me that God loved me. Right downtown, a co-op, old co-op drugstore on 2nd Avenue. He came right into my face. And he said, Butch, he said, he called me Butch. He said, God loves you so much. And Jesus gave his life for you, for your sins. And I believed in that moment. And I felt the peace come over me. I felt the peace rush over me. And from that moment, there was no more suicidal thoughts. I, lived, I had peace in my heart. And I began to tell everybody I saw about it. <laughs> Got cussed out a few times. That's okay. I love them and they love me today. We laugh about it. But I want us to just take a moment and I want you with human contact to love on one another. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I just want us to pray. And I want you to be able to dissolve and soften some of that pain. It doesn't take anything away from the loved ones we miss. But they wouldn't want us to live with a heavy burden, laboring under a heavy burden in our heart. They wouldn't want us to live that way. And we have to, they would love to, if they were seeing us right now, they would want to see, yes, I want to see my loved one move on. It's okay to miss me. And I don't want you to walk under a heavy load anymore. I loved you. And I want you to be able to love open and freely. So if you would join me, please. I'm just going to say a prayer over you and over myself because I am one also. I miss my nephew, Sean. I miss my brother-in-law, Francis. I miss so many others. So much. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. We all come in agreement. In our language, your name is Betahadishtaya. Betahadishtaya is an ancient name that we had for you. We ask you to visit us now in this place. We ask you to begin to heal the wounded place in us to soften it so that we could be able to love. We would be able to unite with that one voice as one people. That no longer would the pain inside of us lash out at others. That we wouldn't become irritable with others. That we wouldn't become 
carry anger, that we wouldn't grieve beyond what our loved ones would want for us, but we hold them as precious in our memories. I pray for healing, a healing touch for each person here today. I pray for that softening. I pray for the covering of your Holy Spirit to move in our midst from person to person. Bring peace. We honor the memories of our loved ones. We forgive those who have trespassed against us. And to close this prayer, I want you all to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Give each other a hug on the way. I'm going to... I'm going to turn this uh, podium back over to the chief here. But I want to just say that I am, <clears throat> as you find your seats, I'll just make my closing comment. I'm emboldened to do this. I'm emboldened to do this because of the memory of the late Andrew Isaac, David Salmon, Peter John, and other, others of our chiefs. I remember them standing in this place over at the Eagles Hall, wherever we were meeting. And I remember them, they weren't ashamed to say the name of Jesus. Do you remember that? They were never ashamed of it. They knew that, yes, we have our traditional beliefs, but we were sent one who sacrificed for us that we could have eternal life. They knew it. They were not ashamed of it, and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. Sometimes people tease me and call me the preacher. It's okay. And I'll be the first one to say I'm not a perfect man. There's some people in this room who knew that. But we don't have to be perfect. We just have to give it all of our heart. So I want you to remember what it means to have be one people with one voice. And that it is always led by love. It is always led by healthy touch, by encouraging words. Chief, I'm proud of you. Chief, I'm proud of what you're doing. I know it's hard. Mothers, fathers, proud of what you've done. I'm proud of your hard work. I'm proud of your educations, your dedication. When we lead out with those kinds of words, when we see somebody Tell them. We've got to tell them. We've got to speak it. You'll speak life. You'll speak life into one another. No arguing. We can disagree on issues, but that's up here. Down here, we have to join and be united. So with that, blessings on you. I thank you for your attention, your patience. God bless you. Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Chief. You're doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. What powerful words. Um, as a
Thank you. I want to give you a beaver hat and birch basket made by Lena Ticket and a jar of fish. Oh. <laughs> Hope <they're cute. laughs> Keep you warm going back to your cabin. What? <laughs> I said. <laughs> okay. There you go. There's some little stuff right there in the bottom. Can you sing one song real quick? Yes, go ahead. Let's do song. Well, start off Kylie up. Oh. It's like the meeting, 1991, AFM. Oh, you guys got it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Here, down here. Oh, oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just want to say, uh, Chief, that uh, Will, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for bringing us up here like you did. And I could feel that power. I could feel that connection that you were talking about. Right in and front I of think us. It's just, yeah. I'm down here. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Where is he? <laughs> I, I was wondering if anybody else was hearing me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chief. Go ahead. Okay. Well, so anyway, uh, we'll, I'm not there yet. I'm still down here. <laughs> talking about that's one people, one voice. And I, I, your message, your prayer really resonated with me. And I hope that that message will be received by the people that's gathered here. And that for the next two, three days will continue with that unity, that one voice. And um, so I think your keynote address was a really wonderful message. And again, thank you for that prayer for all of us. Merci Thank you, Steve. Spud?
survivors from your kind. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you get these past presidents going, there's no stopping. Well, that's the nicest thing I heard anyone call you. <laughs> I, I forgot about this, it's very important. This, is, um, this was presented to me by Spud Williams at the end of my term as president. And he gave it to me, and it was the most powerful thing that I had received. And he told me, he said, there's two of these. The other one was buried with Chief Andrew Isaac. And I never felt like this is something that belongs to Will Mayo. That would cheapen it. And I want this to be a symbol of our unity. The evil is so important in our old teachings. It was the eagle that led the clans up the rivers and that pointed to them their lands. That's what makes the eagle, that story makes the eagle so important to us. And all the clans were assigned into their places as the eagle led the leader. And the leader's clan was the middle of the river clan. And the reason they called the middle of the river is because the eagle led that leader up the middle of the river and pointed out where all the people's homeland is, each clan, each tribe. And that is one of the symbols of this. There's others, and some I don't even know. But I wanted to present this to Chief Ridley as the elected leader of the tribes, that this can remain within the Tanana Chiefs Conference as a cultural treasure. And that we would remember Andrew Isaac's words that guide us to this day. So with that, I want to present it to you, Chief. <laughs> 